Hello and welcome to Northampton Community College's Ethics and Moral Problems course. Um, this presentation on equality and fairness will be looking specifically at the philosophical thinking of a P.N. Coates um, and even more specifically the issues of race, particularly that of being black in the United States. Uh, so these two philosophical thinkers I've chosen, they're going to offer you uh, comparative and differing variations on the issue so that we know that you know there's no monolithic black perspective per se. And, and to say both of these individuals are still alive with us, thank goodness. So there is yet uh, much that they can say for themselves and how they particularly might migrate through the issue and respond to things that are happening in our present culture. Nonetheless, let's start out with uh, Kwame Anthony Apia. Uh, Apia taught at Harvard and Princeton, and he's currently the philosophy professor at New York University, where he lives in Manhattan with his current husband. Um, he was born in London, and he's of mixed ancestry. So his uh, mother has English um, aristocracy, and his father was born in Ghana. Um, and again, I always point out that we're always shaped by our experience. I'll let you um, delve into exactly how that might have shaped his thinking. Now, something that's going to stand out as a distinction between a P and Coates, you know, is that a P is notion that identities can and should move towards a post-racial world. In other words you know, some future where we're not even really speaking about the distinctions by race. And this is in part of a larger philosophical notion that he's really been working on, that he's entitled cosmopolitanism. So in other words, you know, each person is really a global citizen. Uh, and this should always lead to a sense of universality um, plus differences. But the distinction here is that really we need to focus on the universality and have that take precedence over any differences, whether those differences are um, real or perceived. Now, this thinking is predicated on understanding of race having no known biological uh, foundation. Uh, this, of course, is not controversial in itself, um, but from that lack of biological underpinnings of race, at least the, the, what we know of it now, you know, um, Apia further concludes that you know the group identity, you know, which is formed by this unscientific determination of race. You know, that group identity becomes the individual's identity, and then each person associates within that group. You know, so this means for a black individual in the United States that as the color of skin is the only viewable identifier of race identification, um, that rather than following the biology, that identity um, based on skin color will determine one's race, and then the individual will identify with that group based solely on the skin color. Now, his point is that this group membership has, you know, positive and negative impacts on society. You know, so it does foster, but it also limits uh, individual freedom by the identity of that particular individual within the group. So for APIA, the race categories that everybody in the United States and Western society uses for identity purposes, he would understand those things simply as folk races. You know, that is without any really known basis in biology. They're simply categories that, you know, individuals absorb as children. Um, and then you grow up, and then from, but from a very young age, they tend to shape uh, one's own world and then one's reactions um, to that world from these perspectives of these folk races per se um, are what determine our identities. You know, so since one's folk race here is determined by skin color, you know, just by appearance, you know, then they are thought to be something essential. In other words, just because we see this, there must be something essential within the individual themselves. And, and then they further are understood to form and explain particular attitudes and behaviors within those racial categories based on these appearances. So these categories then, they go on to become bracketed racial categories, and they further form social identities, which are not very well grounded um, in biological categories. So individuals who identify as black, white, or Asian. Now, Apia posits that these racial categories require three things for this folk race in order to function as a label. The first one he says is ascription. You know, so certain qualities and factors, they have to be applied to the group. Uh, the second is identification. You know, individual people then need to identify with the labels that were attached through those particular ascriptions. And then finally, treatment. On the basis of that identification or label, as it is for APIA, you know, the group needs to be treated differently simply on account of that ascription and identity. You know, so for him, then, there's various norms and these traits. They emerge by, you know, each folk race is known or how it's known and to, um, to be held. And then individuals simply identify with those norms and those traits. And the society as a whole recognizes these folk race races 
and then treat those individuals, um, the groups that is, distinctly based on those. So it's just a movement through these, but these norms and traits, um, they are the formation then of racial categories. Now, it should be clear at this point that if this is correct, uh, if it's a correct understanding of race, then the only way to really overcome it is to have some deconstruction of the racial categories. And that'll be the means to overcome racism and, and the evils and all the evils that flow from the differences based on appearance and identity. So a P is making the scientific claim that there is no biological underpinning to race, at least that can be uh, determined. Um, but he's skeptical, you know, that there could be any um, identity based solely on race that's something biological. But, but let me make this point, because this is probably um, going to be true, at least according to his philosophy, regardless if there is something that is found essential in the future. He says, even if there are some biological markers for race, according to APIA, you know, so many individuals, you know, have varying ancestry. You know, we don't really have, we're not as pure as we think in DNA tests today, especially the ones that you might, you know, spend money to find out your um, uh, ethnicities and such and origins of race. They're, they're quite varied. Nobody's, you know, pure per se. So they have their origins in multiple regions of the world, right? Um, so the presence of race really comes down to a one of percentage. And then there arises from that, you know, a choice of, well, which race will we adhere to based on what? The, the identity that we have with it, where we grew up, the larger percentage, you know, or do we simply just return to some visible factors? Okay, so even if there's no essential feature to race, so Pia recognizes that um, you can accept that as true. Um, but across the globe, simply to try to undo this, you know, the fact that we all have all been formed in this thinking, um, to undo that impression, it's daunting. And it's unlikely it's going to change anytime soon. But that being said, he still thinks that we need to move away from this, what he calls the race essentialism. Um, and that is, itself is what is necessary um, for, let's say, a healthy society. So moving away from, you know, ethno-racial identities, it's simply worth the time and the effort. You know, he thinks way too many individuals who identify with one group or, or another, they unfortunately, they tie their fate to these groups um, that both emit and they become the target of misunderstandings. You know, now be certain that Apia holds to the caveat that regardless of the society identity, you know, racism still exists. So this isn't discounting racism, particularly here we're talking in the United States. Um, in some level, because of that, of race-like cohesion, it's necessary to combat the treatment. But there has to be a group that's suppressed, and then that group tries to overcome their prejudice against them based on those identities. So he says, even if they exist only as folk races, right, you know, Pia recognizes the subjective realities of race classification, uh, but he would simply would deny that there's any um, objective foundation to it. In other words, he's just asking us to be careful on how we apply these racial categories. You know, he feels that using the categories currently present, you know, is nothing more than enforcing an ideology from the 18th century, which has created such races, and that has only led to depersonalization of the people in particular races, the domination of one race over another, and even, unfortunately, genocide. Now, if you want to read more, um, you can consider In My Father's House, Africa and the Philosophy of Culture. Um, that was from 1993. Or if you want something uh, more current from 2018, you can look up The Lies That Bind Us, Rethinking Identity. Our other philosopher in this presentation is Tahani Hasi. Um, his writing Between the World and Me is the form of a letter. Well, he writes it in the form of a letter to his 15-year-old son, Samori. Um, that is to say, it may not be the type of academic writing that you know, we might be used to in philosophy. Nonetheless, you know, it's discursive style. Um, Tahani Hasi does speak of his own personal development in the issue of race from, you know, from his own childhood you know, up into through college. Um, there are sections that cover his post-collegiate experience and how race is different abroad. He spent time in France and had some experience of, you know, um, was able to have a different perspective of racism from being outside of the United States. Now, um, again, shaped by experience, Coates' upbringing was distinct from Apia's own, um, where Apia had a privileged, 
you know, Coates was one who grew up in the streets of Baltimore. Now, his writing, uh, Between the World and Me, was intended more so for a black audience. He doesn't say that that I know of, but um, others say that of him. And what the intent there is, is that there's absent was any sense of filtering, you know, what the hard world that he and others like him understand to exist for black persons in the United States. So there's no softening on the topic, you know, no attempt to distort the view, to make it more palatable, digestible to a white audience. Um, so this work is really an expose on the injustice as force on a black person, you know, both in state and in culture. Um, for instance, he makes plain the notion that any reality of an American dream, you know, it really is a lie. And it's a lie um, at the black person's expense. You know, as much as any movement hopes to awaken such a dream for the black person, in reality, for the black person, nothing will really come to fruition. So it's a lie. Um, so there's much in Coates' life that, you know, radicalized his views on race and justice, you know, which beyond the various cases of merit in society, you know, one was the shooting of his friend, Prince Jones Jr., by a black police officer of Prince George's County, Virginia. You know, the police force in that county um, was roughly, I think, 40% black. Um, and I'm not going to try to put words in the mouth of Coates. You can read about all this for yourself. Uh, but there was a sense that the black elite, because there were many black politicians that just seemed unfazed by this whole incident, um, the impression that they simply have adopted, whether they're black or not, have adopted the prejudices of the white people in power. Okay, so a critique of Coates's book, and remember critiques are not negative per se, a critique of Coates's book may help put this all in perspective. In 2015, a New York Times article by Michelle Alexander, she points out that, you know, she read through his book and there was a disappointment. Um, and the disappointment stemmed from the expectation that Coates would offer some, you know, description of the struggle that the inner black um, faces in contrast to the so-called dream, you know, which they never have access to. But, you know, on a second reading, uh, this person who levied the critique, Alexander, thought perhaps it's good. Um, and the reason is that this book really doesn't offer answers. What it gives is challenges, and those challenges are to help us wrestle with all these questions on our own. She says maybe this is a time for questioning, searching, and struggling, you know, without really believing the struggle can be won. So um, the challenge really is for us to search and to struggle. That's where the focus is. Now, another aspect of Coates' view on race and systematic oppression of the blacks in the United States is the issue of reparation. Um, Coates' book uh, makes a listing of the various historical ways that blacks have been oppressed, from slavery to Jim Crow laws to many of the present-day protests, um, none, of the less, uh, none of the least which have given rise to Black Lives Matter. Uh, nonetheless, you know, reparations is a very, very vague term, and it conjures the idea of some financial payment being made to blacks you know, by a government who has become wealthy and powerful by the enslavement and suppression of blacks from an earlier time. You know, so we're always saying, well, this reparation is like from who to whom, particularly, okay? So there's no really no need for um, me to go further on, you know, exactly what all that means. But what I'll do is allow um, Coates himself to speak um, and how he understands the issue of reparation. Now, in a March 2019 interview with Eric Levitz for The Intelligencer. Now, there's a written version of this that appeared um, in March 19, 2019 issue of New York Magazine. Uh, what Coates states is that, and this is him speaking, when I say I am for reparations, I am saying that I am for the idea that this country and its major institutions has had an extractive relationship with black people for much of our history, that this fact explains basically all the socioeconomic gaps that exists between blacks and whites in America. And thus, that the way to close that gap, really, is to pay it back. Um, in terms of political candidates, um, how should this be talked about? Um, how should this be dealt with? He says, it seems like it would be a very easy solution. Um, it's actually the policy recommendation that I gave in the piece, and that is to support H.R. 40. Okay, that's the bill that says you form a commission, you study what damage was done from slavery and the legacy of slavery, and then you try to figure out the best ways to remedy it. Now, so there's nothing specific there, but I guess his point is it, you need to start a dialogue with all of this. Now, you should be aware that Coates himself 
today, at least it's said of, of him, holds to a, um, a form of optimism. You know, not the same post-racial um, optimism of Apia, but rather one that, you know, a fight must continue. But if it makes little sense to have a fight if there isn't some sense of progress attainable. All right, so um, everything here is simply about moving forward and having attainable progress. You know, in the same interview that I spoke of earlier, Coach says, Let's tell folks how we imagine this new America being, and a vision of that without any explicit and direct confrontation with one of the country's oldest evils, with an evil that is actually foundational in this country. He sees that as an ext- that is extremely problematic, if you're just going to take that off the table. Um, so like the issue of race in the United States, Coates is admittedly evolving. Um, there is always going to be you know, some level of progress that is moving forward, and that's what the struggle um, that's what the challenge is, is to keep moving that forward. Now, if you want to read more on Coates, um, you can look up his 2014 article in The Atlantic entitled The Case for Reparations. Um, and, of course, you could read the fuller text of Between the World and Me or a 2019 novel that came out recently called The Water Dancer. Okay, I hope this short presentation was at least a good introduction. Um, unless, of course, you've already heard of these prominent philosophers already. That'd be great, Right. Um, but both, you know, P and Coates, um, they're an, uh, an important part of the discussion, an important part of um, trying to forming some sort of balanced understanding of this issue of race in the United States. So it was my intention, you know, for this to be balanced on this very important issue of race in the United States. Um, and I hope you found it somewhat provocative and insightful. Thank you for listening and watching.